special guest with us today. His grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhuji. So Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is a mentor, monk, speaker. He is also a spiritual teacher for nearly 25 years in Bhakti Yoga tradition through its modern day expressions such as ISKCON. He has authored of 27 books that explain the relevance of Vedic wisdom texts, including the Bhagavad Gita and Ramayana. He is also author of the world's only daily blog on Bhagavad Gita, GitaDaily.com, where he has written some 4,000 articles on Bhagavad Gita. He is invited speaker at TEDx, World Peace Conference, UNESCO, Intel, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, and also some universities like Stanford, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, MIT, and Cambridge. He gives 400 talks across 100 cities in four continents every year. So we are very, very fortunate. Please loudly chant Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. So Prabhuji will be speaking on a very special topic today. Relevance of spirituality as a shock absorber and a goal transformer. So over to you, Prabhuji. Okay. Hare Krishna. Is there a sound system or this is itself the sound system? Oh, okay. That's high tech. Okay. <laughs> Am I audible behind? Thank you. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shreemate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Krupa Sindhubya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Thank you very much for coming today So as is mentioned, I'll speak on the topic of what is the relevance of spirituality in our life. And I'll speak this based on the Bhagavad Gita. I'll be using this tablet as a whiteboard. I'll write some things over there. And we'll talk about it in two broad terms. How spirituality can help us as a shock absorber. And later, how it can help us as a goal transformer. So let me start by asking a question to all of you. Uh, why do you think the Bhagavad Gita was spoken? What was the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita? Would anyone like to say what the purpose was? Okay. Would anyone like to say what, what do you think was the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita? Or is the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, please. Yes, to help Arjuna, who was in a very difficult position. Thank you. That's true. Any other purposes? Yes. To provide us with a manual for life. True. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, to instruct human beings? about the ultimate goal of life, yes. Thank you, true. Yes. To connect us to our consciousness, nicely put, true. Thank you. Any one more answer, anyone? Yes, please. To summarize, the Vedic literature. To summarize Vedic literature, yes. It's very vast and Arjuna did a crash course. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> true. So, 
let's begin all the answers that you gave are true and i'll try to integrate them in the analysis that i will do now if you look at the bhagavad gita itself hmm, it is spoken to a person who was in great anguish arjuna at the start of the gita was reduced to tears tam tatha krupaya vishtam ashrupurna kulekshanam oh his eyes were overflowing with tears now to contemplate the gravitas of the situation arjuna is a trained warrior and one of the key elements of the training for warriors is to not show pain or weakness because weakness will be exploited by the opponents and one of the greatest signs of weakness especially in the battlefield setting is tears so we can just imagine how much anguish arjuna must have been in that he was reduced to tears it's like normally when a fire comes some a fire occurs people may start panicking may start run here then he had screaming but if there the fire comes and the fire fighter fighter start panicking and screaming that it means it must be a really devastatingly alarming situation so what was it that agonized that anguished arjuna so much now some people say that actually arjuna just developed cold feet and then you know he just become scared of fighting well nothing could be further from the truth because in the first chapter of the gita when arjuna expresses his reservations against fighting there is one thing that is conspicuous by its absence and that is not once does arjuna express fear of his own death not even once so for him the fear was something else entirely fear was of doing the wrong thing that is the fighting the right thing to do that was the question that afflicted arjuna and why why did it afflict him so much because arjuna faced the gita starts with what we can call as the an ethical dilemma an ethical dilemma means that there are two sides a moral dilemma is where one side is moral the other side is immoral but ethical dilemma is where both sides are have some ethical basis to it but then which one to choose so for arjuna on one side was his kula dharma kula dharma is his dynastic duty and then other side was his kshatriya dharma so what is his kshatriya dharma as a warrior it is warrior duty so as a member of the kuru dynasty he was expected to protect the members of his dynasty as a warrior he was expected to punish wrong doers punish aggressors punish anti social elements who were threats to society now what does he do when relatives turn to be aggressors say to get a closer understanding of the situation that suppose is a very respected fearless police officer who has apprehended very dangerous and elusive criminals and that police officer is told now that there is this one criminal in this area so deadly you catch him if you can't catch him shoot him and then he gets over there with great industry and fearlessness and is about to arrest that criminal that criminal gets the wind of it and starts running away while running he slips and falls and then he turns over and when he turns over he has his gun raised to shoot he notices that criminal is actually his own long lost brother 
Now, what does he do? Should he sh do his police duty and shoot? Or should he do his brother's duty and let his brother go? So, oh, for a responsible person, you know, the greatest pain, see there are different kinds of people who have different kinds of pains. For a child, breaking of toy is the greatest pain. Mm -hmm. For a person who is very money-minded, losing maybe stock market crash is the greatest pain. For a responsible person, the thought that my action may cause harm to someone instead of benefiting someone, that causes the greatest pain. Like in the pandemic, oh, we face such a big crisis and there even doctors might be well-wishing, well but they just didn't know how to deal with it. We didn't have a cure, we didn't know what to do about it. So sometimes they administer some medicine and it backfires. So that thought that even with our good intentions, the results might be counterproductive. So that was the agony for Arjuna. So he said, should I be fighting at all? So he's pulled between these two duties. And that is why the starting question that Arjuna asks in 2.7 is, Pruchamitvam dharma sammudha chetaha. So he asks, I ask you, what is dharma? He, he, it's interesting, Arjuna asks a universal question. Arjuna doesn't ask, should I fight? He says, and he doesn't even ask, what is my duty? He doesn't ask, mama dharma. He says, what is dharma? What is the right thing to do? Generally speaking, we all may sometimes get backed into a corner. Where whatever we do, seems to only increase the problems. And when that happens, we may get a fundamental question. Is it even, why am I here? What am I meant to do? What is worth doing? Is life even worth living? There's one philosopher, he's Alberto Camus, he said that the big that the biggest philosophical question, he said, life is full of distress. Therefore, the biggest philosophical question is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> There's another philosopher, philosopher, Sartre, he said that actually, if you really think about all the problems in life, every time you pass by a fourth story window, you will have an existential crisis. Should I jump out of it or stay on the floor? <laughs> Why? Because sometimes we feel, what is even the point of living? Many of us may not get to that point. And if you don't get to that point, well, in one sense we are fortunate. But in another sense, it is at that point we start asking, what really counts in life? And so Arjuna experiences a great shock. It's a shock to his system. He's been trained to fight. He's been trained to protect his family and his citizens. And now, his training is pulling him in two different directions. And what is he supposed to do? And it's that question that agonizes him. And then how does Krishna address the question? Krishna addresses it in a very significant way. See, many people nowadays practice spirituality. Or at least they say that they like to practice spirituality. And their idea of spirituality is something that makes me feel calm, makes me feel peaceful. Oh, I heard that music. It was so calming. I went to that uh, beach. I was looking out at the ocean. I felt so calm. It was a, such a spiritual experience. So, we often think of spirituality as anything that is centered on calming our emotions. While that is true, spirituality does calm our emotions. But spirituality is much, much more. Spirituality is about challenging our conceptions. What is really important in life? What really counts? Without that, 
our emotions may become calm for some time. I may look at the beach, I look at the ocean, I look at the mountain, I hear some music, I feel some calm. And after that, as soon as I turn back to my phone, and I see this person, how dare this person do like this? And all the anger comes back again. Isn't it? So, it is that agitation is inevitable to some extent. So we need to challenge our conceptions. And the Gita starts not by answering Arjuna's question about, okay, what is the right thing to do? He answers by saying that before we can decide activity, we need to decide activity. The foundation for that is identity. Identity has to be understood before activity can be decided. And the Gita talks about how we have multiple levels of identities. We can say that we have many functional identities. Functional identities means that according to our function, we may have many identities. Say for example, some of us may be a parent. Some of us may be a engineer or a prof some professional. We may be a, say, now a Kiwi citizen. That some of us may be a sibling. Some of us may be an activist for some cause. So these are all our identities in this world. And they are functional identities. And underlying all of these is our fundamental identity. So the fundamental identity, Krishna says, is that we are Atma, we are spiritual beings. Now, in the case of Arjuna, he had two functional identities, which were pulling him in two different directions. One was, for Arjuna, one identity was as a Kshatriya, and the other was as a Kurunandana, a member, an illustrious member of the Kuru dynasty. And these two identities were pulling him in two different directions. So how do we resolve this? He says, you have to go down to your fundamental identity. Now, now why do we need to go to our fundamental identity? Because actually all our other identities, see from identity, there comes activity. From activity, we get possessions, we get positions. And all these build our identity. However, everything that comes from our identity, say if I consider the functional identity over here, so we all need a functional identity. This is not to be trivialized or rejected. It is important in its own way. From functional identity, we will do certain activities. We may learn responsibility by those activities. And when we do the activities responsibility, then generally we, get, we look at it into two broad connections. We get possessions, and these are seen as trappings of success. And then we may get relations. Relations, connections. Oh, this, and these relations are. Okay, what happened here? Alt tab, or how do I do this now? Where is. Sorry, okay, sorry. So. So here, we may get, generally, in relationships, we get certain positions. Oh, I'm a, I'm a powerful person, I'm a wealthy person, I'm a respected person, like that. So now, the problem with the world is that, all of this, so not the Atma, but everything below that, it's all perishable. None of this will last. Any of this can be taken away from us. And when it is taken away from us, it can be very jolting. Somebody may be a doctor or a surgeon. And suppose they have an accident in which their hand gets permanently damaged. Then, then who are they? Uh, one of my friends in California has done his PhD in the post-celebrity lives of sports players, especially basketball players. Now, sports is one of the areas in which fame can come in a stupendous way. But the longevity 
is remarkably low in most other careers people get going by the time they come to 35 40 45 then they start rising up but generally in most sports by the time you come to 40 you are like a dinosaurus <laughs> so after that what do you do how do you reinvent yourself and so their whole functional identity is taken away at one time almost helplessly so for arjuna so we can have various kinds of shocks in life i was talking about how spirituality can act as a shock absorber but it is not just by feeling hearing something coming looking at something coming that is a very superficial level what sp- how spirituality calms us is by challenging our conceptions of who we are so as long as we identify with a functional identity whenever the things associated with that identity are taken away we will be shaken we may even be shattered so i saw an ad in in canada it says that the ad was you are your car you are your car so the idea is that your car the kind of car that you had defines your status level your financial bracket okay you are your car now in sanskrit there is a word called ahankar <laughs> so aham car i am the car <laughs> <laughs> so actually the, what the gita says is that we are not even our body to misidentify with a, our body itself is ahankar it's an illusory self conception but to I, for the soul the body itself is like a car and to identify the car to identify ourselves with the car in which our bodily car is that is you can say ahankar squared <laughs> so now suppose somebody identifies very strongly with their car mm-hmm. so here there is the innermost identity is that the atma then there is the there is the deha there is the body mm-hmm. now outside that suppose there is a car mm-hmm. now suppose they are driving in the new car and they come to a red signal they stop and behind them somebody just hits their back bumper and this was hey, what how dare you now there are incidents of road rage especially in america or where you know guns are readily really easily available so in road rage somebody just can pick a gun and shoot the person behind you so now the the car bumper might have just had a slight scratch or not even a scratch but why such a reaction because their identity is invested in the car if my car has a scratch it is almost as bad as my face having a scar you know it defaces me it deforms me it's intolerable so for all of us when we talk when we get shocks in life and we all will be shocked soon or later that is just the nature of life what happens is wherever our functional identity is invested in that something goes wrong so i define myself as a professional and suddenly i bo- i get the pink slip i define myself as a parent and my child stops listening to me i start thinking i am a failure as a parent if i am failure as a parent then who am i you know if somebody defines themselves by by their physical appearance and then they one day wake up and stand on the weighing scale and they get a heart attack what happened <laughs> so our functional identity can be shaken can be shattered so if we really want to go beyond the shocks of the world to learn to withstand those shocks the people talk about grit about resilience and especially those became very important during the recent upheavals that we have had in the world so how do the gita say we develop this inner resilience by say if we consider for arjuna so a is atma a is also arjuna now arjuna for him he had two levels of functional identities one was as i said as a kshatriya and the other was as a kurunandana 
Now Arjuna felt that he is he identified himself with both of these, and he felt that in one of these I am going to lose unbearably. Either I lose my relatives, I lose my elders like Bhishma and Drona. What is the point of living if I have to fight them? If I become the cause of their death? But if I don't do that, then it is not just a matter of prestige for him. Oh, people will call me a coward. See, for a person who is trained as a warrior, you know, their courageousness is is not just a, like additional matter of reputation. It's a, the substance of their very character. Just come. You know, I don't want to be cowardly. I don't want to run away from battle. And will I be failing in my duty to my citizens? Will I be failing in my duty to my immediate family? Because they will all be reduced to poverty if I do that. So he felt that either way, I am going to lose unbearably. And it is at that time Krishna said, you have to withdraw your sense of identity. So in instead of having your sense of identity, See, there is, there is identity and there is the sense of identity. We can have many identities. But our sense of identity may not be defined by a particular thing. So, his sense of identity was invested in both these things. And Krishna said, both as a Kshatriya and as a Kurunandana, he says, withdraw your sense of identity inwards. Understand, first and foremost, you are a spiritual being. And as a soul, you are indestructible. You are beyond being damaged or destroyed by anything. And to the extent you understand yourself as a soul, to that extent the shocks of the world won't shock you. So another way to understand this is that if we consider that the soul there is the mind and there is the body. Hmm. So now, with respect to the body, we can have various situations. With respect to the mind, we can have various emotions. And what Krishna says is, if you understand you are a spiritual being, then you understand, in one sense, that actually, you become an observer of your situations and your emotions. And this is Udasina Udasinam. Krishna says you become a Sakshi, an observer, a witness. And you understand that situations will come, they will go. Emotions will come, they will go. If some of, uh, some of you have the habit of keeping a journal, you know, maybe if you look back 10 years before, and look at what was worrying you the most at that time. Maybe you, we were panicky about something. We were overwhelmed. You know, at every phase in our life, there have been challenges. And at that time, we thought, if this goes wrong, my whole life will be destroyed. Now, if we look back at that situation, we think, yeah, yeah it was important. But why was I get so overworked about it? Because what happened is now we have the benefit of distance. But at that time we were in that situation. So Krishna says that situations will come and go. Tams Titiksha Swabharata. He says, he says, two talk, Matras Parshas to Kaunteya, Sheet Ushna Sukha Dukkadaha. So Sheet Ushna refers to situations. At the physical level, things will change. And Sukha Dukkha. It refers to emotions. They will also come and go. He says, you are unaffected by them. You are above them. And that is how you can withstand them. You can tolerate them. You can survive them. Now, another way to understand the same point is, we can put it vertically over here. There's the soul, there's the mind, and there's the body. So, now, our existence is three level, but our consciousness, where it is, will determine how much we are affected by something. So, if we can raise our consciousness to the spiritual level, then we will be able to see 
the situations and the emotions from a detached perspective there will be internal security so spirituality is not just about calming our emotions yes that's a, that's a definitely an aspect of it but how do we calm those emotions by challenging our conceptions of who i really am and those practices that can factually help us raise our consciousness upwards raise our consciousness to the spiritual level those will enable us to withstand shocks so spirituality is about the level of consciousness and for example right now we are doing kirtans see the hare krishna maha mantra the holy name this is actually you call it like a, it's a sonic elevator sonic elevator means it is sound that can elevate our consciousness so the more we let that sound enter into us through our ears into our heart the more our consciousness enters into the holy name and it's like we are entering into elevator and we just enter into the elevator and stay in the elevator our consciousness start rising upwards and if we immerse ourselves in the holy name we will experience a certain level of calmness it is not that the problems will disappear but the agitation within us due to the problems will decrease substantially so now we can't remove problems from our life but we can reduce the size of those problems and that is what spirituality does it decreases the shock that we experience so this is one aspect of spirituality as a shock absorber what are the second aspect i said i'll talk about do you remember goal transformer so i'll talk about that now and then after that we can have some questions so at one level the gita is very categorical at least in the beginning in terms of differentiating between matter and spirit mm -hmm. but at the same time this is not all that the gita does i was recently asked a question that if krishna wanted to tell arjuna to tolerate he says if you can tolerate heat and cold tolerate uh, happiness and distress then why not just tolerate the whatever kauravas have done and just avoid the war isn't it so why not extend tolerance over there well there is a reason for that see tolerance does not mean passivity tolerance does not mean weakness so what does tolerance mean the gita talks about two things so one is we raise our consciousness up upward so that we are not affected by the situations but that is not all that we need to do on one side spirituality ensures that we are not affected by the situations but at the same time we have roles we have responsibilities in the world so we want to affect the situation we want to affect situations positively isn't it we have a role to play in the world and that is the second part a shock absorber means okay i don't want i will not be that affected by it but there is the other aspect we interact with the world in a way that we try to make things better so we affect positively so so in that regard tolerance what it means essentially is it has two aspect things so keep small things small but there is a purpose for keeping small things small and that is so that we can focus on big things now suppose say you are in this class right now and you are really interested in this class mm -hmm. and while you are hearing uh, this actually happened to me one devotee i was giving a class on tolerance there is one devotee who really likes the classes so he was there and he he there are some devotees who who often after classes give very candid feedbacks to me and i like that because then i also learn what points register what points are important i'm a writer so the point that register i often 
I often write them on further, I develop them further in my future classes. So sometimes I get quite uh, revealing feedback. One day one devotee came to me and said after the class, Prabhu, your class was terrible. And he had a bright smile on his face. So I was wondering what happened. And then I understood that in his excitement, he had it made a basic vocabulary mistake. He wanted to say your class was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up it was terrible. <laughs> so anyway, so I was giving this class on tolerance and then I asked the devotee after the class, so how did you find the class? He said, Prabhu, I got an opportunity to apply the class in the class itself. Really? I said, what do you mean? He said that the devotee sitting next to me, the person sitting right behind me, was constantly talking on the phone. <laughs> and I felt very annoyed. But then I thought, this is the opportunity to tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> so I tolerated without getting angry. And I said, I am getting angry now. <laughs> so if you come for a class, the important thing is to hear the class. And say, what can be tolerated is, maybe the seat we are sitting on is not very comfortable. Then we think, OK, this is just for half an hour, one hour. I can be here that. We can tolerate that. Sometimes it may be a little too hot, a little too cold. That we can tolerate. But if somebody is constantly talking, then what is happening is, it's not a small thing. Because it is interfering with the big thing. The big thing here is to hear and understand. So, tolerance, is it becomes passivity if we let ourselves be blocked from doing the big things in our life. That is not what tolerance is about. Tolerance is keep small things small so that we can focus on big things. And our mind does have a tendency to make small things big. Mm -hmm. One of my friends is, uh, is a fa practices family law in Canada. The family law is just a polite way of saying basically they deal with divorce. So. Uh, he told me that sometimes the kind of people who come for divorce, there's, there's this, this whole principle of no-fault divorce now. And that makes it, like, people, they may have been in a marriage for six years and they get, get out of that marriage faster than they what can get out of a 60-day phone contract. Nothing is required. So he said, one couple came to me, they, divorce, they want a divorce. Why? He says, because we stay in the same house and we can't agree on what temperature to keep the air con. <laughs> now, is that something worth separating about? So yeah, there are certain things you need to tolerate. So keep small things small. But in this case, there is a big thing involved. See, Duryo, Arjuna, Krishna told Arjuna, you're not just fighting to gain a kingdom for your family. You're fighting to establish dharma in the world. To establish the rule of virtue in the world. The opposite side was so brutal that they tried to dishonor and disrobe Draupadi in public. It is not just in public, in the royal assembly. That means somebody commits crime, not a crime in a, in a dark corner in the street, somebody goes to the police station and commits a crime. That means they had no fear of the law at all. If such a person were to be given unchallenged power, Okay, the mind shudders to think what kind of atrocities that person would do. So Krishna said, well, you have a bigger purpose. So this kind of atrocity or a person who does this kind of atrocity cannot be tolerated. So what happens is we need to function in the world. And at one level we want inner calmness. But we want inner calmness not because we just turn away from the world. We want inner calmness so that we can increase our outer effectiveness. Outer effectiveness. So for spirituality, in that sense, offers us both these things. There is, on one side, inner calmness. Sorry about the handwriting. You know, before I started, I started using the tablet only about a week ago. So before that, I used to, for the last seven, eight years, I used to write, I used to use a pen only for two things. You know, signing my books and signing the immigration forms. 
<laughs> when I go from one country to another, <laughs> are the visa forms. So I've lost touch with writing. So outer effectiveness. So now both are important. Now Krishna tells Arjuna that you need to see your role in the world from a bigger perspective. So to understand this, let's consider a day-to-day -day situation. And I'll talk about this in terms of one framework that the Gita gives. Suppose there is a school where are three classrooms are there next to each other. And in all three classrooms, teachers are teaching students. And we go and ask the first teacher, what are you doing? And the teacher has such a vexed, resentful look on the face. He says, I am struggling to teach these dumb kids this dumb subject. Hmm. And then we go to the next teacher. He asks, what are you doing? And they say, I am struggling to earn my livelihood. Then we go to the third teacher. He asks, what are you doing? And the teacher says, I am striving to shape the minds and characters of those who will shape the future of the world. Hmm. Now all three are doing the same activity. But their mentality is different. Their action is the same, but their vision is very different. So now, who do you think will be most inspired to do their work? Third one, isn't it? So, the Gita says that these three visions, they occur according to three modes. Sattva, Rajas, what is the third one? Tamas. So, goodness, passion and ignorance. So, in Tamas, we reduce everything to just one negative aspect of it. It's like that is how biases and prejudices come. Then we reduce an entire community to just one particular negative quality. These people, these people are so selfish. These people, these people are so arrogant. So yes, now it may be true that yes, there are some students which are not so intelligent, not so interested. I mean, some subjects are difficult. They could be difficult even for the teacher. But that is not all that is there to teach. So we could say in Tamas, our world gets shrunk. In Rajas, it expands a little bit more. At least there is some sense of responsibility. You know, I have to earn a living. To live, I have to earn a living. And that's what I am doing over here. But in Sattva, our world expands bigger. There we see that I am doing, I am a part of something valuable. Something worthwhile. And we could say that what is the difference between the two of things? Overall, when we rise in our consciousness, the sense of meaning we find in life that rises. In Tamas, we practically find no meaning in life. The philosophers I quoted earlier, they might be very intelligent in the terms of their capacity to analyze and articulate. But in terms of their conclusions, it is very unfortunate. Their vision is very shrunk. In Rajas, it is a little bit expanded. They think, okay, I have to live, life is tough, and I have to work hard, I have to earn a living. And I have to take care of myself, I have to take care of my family. And I'll do some work for that. But in Sattva, we see a bigger picture. Now, of course, beyond Sattva is what is called as Shuddha Sattva. Where we see ourselves as not just fragmented beings. Not just in small individuals lost in a big bad world, struggling to make a difference. We see that each one of us is a precious part of the Supreme Soul. So, we are Atma, that is one identity that Krishna talks about. But he says the Atma is a part of the Paramatma, of the Supreme Soul. And Mamai Vamsho Jeeva Loke. Jeeva Bhutaha Sanatana. Each one of us is a part of the Divine. And because we are part of the Divine, each one of us can act in a mood of service to the divine. We can act to make the most positive difference in life. 
suppose there is a big pandemic now there might be a, some very dedicated doctor but they don't have much experience of such a situation they are trying their best to try to help others but suppose in that hospital comes a very expert doctor you know he has a lot of experience for dealing with situations they really know okay we can do this we can do this we can do this now that same earnest doctor if that earnest doctor synergizes with this expert doctor what will happen is that doctor what they do will have much much more benefit so similarly the gita says that whatever we do in our life if we harmonize our endeavors with the divine will with the lord's plan for the world if we act in a mood of service then whatever good we can do we can do it much much more so spirituality in that sense is a goal transformer we see our goal not just to struggle and survive in this world we just we see our goal okay not just to make a big name and fame we we actually see that we can make a contribution toward making a difference sometimes when we act we may all want to make a difference we want to make a difference in our family in our community in our society and sometimes we may feel that you know what am i what i am doing is it going to make any difference at all well it may not make a difference or rather it may take time to see how it is making a difference but we can always make a contribution toward making a difference and this is where the gita's teaching karmanne vadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana don't be attached to the results but at the same time says don't be attached to not working why because we have agency we can act so in general if we consider the three modes our endeavor whatever work we do in life you know in tamas in the mode of ignorance we underestimate our capacity in rajas we overestimate our capacity so for example you know somebody who is uh, somebody who is in rajoguna they think that you know i will just become powerful enough and then everybody will listen to me i was uh, i was giving one corporate corporate seminar and then it was like a work extended workshop and then after that uh, during the break several of the employees came and this they had severe concerns about their boss and how that's understandable but in this case he says the boss he just yells at us he uses such such foul language he has such fearsome temper that you know we dread any encounter with him so then i asked i talked with the boss he had only arranged my program so we had a cordial relationship so i told him you know i, I detected an undercurrent of fear and resentment among the employees hmm as trying to be polite <laughs> <laughs> so he said yeah i know <laughs> he said that you know i know that i yell at them if only they started doing what i told them to do then i wouldn't have to yell at them <laughs> so you know there was no acknowledgement of any problem on his part is so yeah actually in one sense is they they have to obey me how dare they not listen to me well yes people are not robots you now we have to persuade them we have to inspire them sometimes you have to compel them but if compelling is all we are we are doing then we don't have much of a relationship with anyone so sometimes we overestimate our capacities and then that can lead to a lot of frustration but when that happens we go to the other extreme and then we underestimate our capacity we think oh no one listens to me no one cares for me why should i even try why should i do anything at all and that is actually a toxic mentality hmm? because 
if we don't do anything, it is not that we are not doing anything. If we don't do anything, we let things around us go worse and worse. So we need to realistically. Okay, now I'm underestimating, overestimating my capacity to move this tablet. <laughs> what happened? Okay, yeah. So we need to estimate our capacity properly. Estimate accurately. And this is where I'll conclude with one last point that when we act in a mood of service, now what does service mean? A service attitude can mean many things. You know, it means you can come to the temple and do some seva, we chant the holy name, we do some puja, we come to satsang. All these are part of bhakti. But service attitude has a very practical meaning. Service attitude means that two things it has. First is that we accept our limitations. If we understand that my role is as a part, I am not the whole. So we talk about how we are all parts of God. So when we are in Rajoguna, we think I am the whole. I should be able to do everything. And then even in Tamaguna, we think I am nothing. I am no one. But if we are parts, then we have a part. We are not the whole. So we need to accept our limitations. And then second is we act resourcefully within our limitations. So this understanding of service attitude, we accept our limitations. Say for example, if we are parents, then when our kids come to teenage, it's like many parents, or not many, almost every parent starts wondering, what happened to my sweet little child? Who is this sullen, uncommunicative person who is replaced by child? Where has that person gone? So what happens is, sometimes our kids just don't listen to us. And then, we may either get very angry, or we may start feeling very guilty. How did I feel as a parent? It's not like that. They're just going through a phase. It's a phase which is a difficult phase for them. They are trying to discover their functional identity. See, at that time, see, the parents, when the children are very small, in one sense, they have a lot of control. Oh, you cannot go out of the house beyond this time. You have to come back at this time. Otherwise, I'll ground you. I'll take away your privileges. So many things can be done. But as they start growing older, the parents' capacity to control decreases. Now, if we have a service attitude, then we accept that now I cannot control my child the way I control him. He was a small child. But that doesn't mean that I can't, do, I can't do anything at all. We accept our limitations, but we act within those limitations. As they grow older, I think this was Mark Twain, he said, when I was 17, my father was a fool. Now I am 25, and I'm amazed how much the old guy has learned in the last eight years. <laughs> so, it's not so much that the father learned as the child grew up. The perspective changes. So, sometimes if we, if we have a service attitude in different relationships, in different situations, going back to the point of functional identity, sometimes in our functional identity, our role may change. Our influence may change. So service attitude means we accept our limitations. But that doesn't mean I only accept my limitations and I give up. We act resourcefully within our limitations. Okay, earlier I could do this much. But now I can do this much. And I will definitely do this much. This is what I can do. And so sir, we see how do we accept our limitations? By understanding that whatever be the circumstantial cause for these limitations, ultimately it's happening under Krishna's plan. So, I see my limitation not just as another person's uh, rebelliousness or not just as some colleague uh, backstabbed me in my office and that's why I lost this prospect. We, those causes may be there and they may need to be addressed. But we see beyond them. The limitation that has come in my life it is ultimately within the plan of Krishna. So we accept that limitation and then we see 
how can I act resourcefully within that limitation? So how can I act responsibly? How can I act in the mood of service to Krishna in this particular situation? And if we act in that way, we will find that we will be able to grow through that situation. We will be able to learn and grow. And we will be effective even within that situation. So bringing this to Arjuna's particular situation. Now, Arjuna had fought many wars. But he had fought wars in the past against people who were demoniac. He had fought against the same army at one level. Just a few months ago. When was that? At Virat. Hmm? But there he had no intention of killing anyone. He just wanted to teach a lesson to them. He, at that time a part of it was still hopeful. That we can, maybe we can avoid this war. And things can be settled amicably. But now the stakes were drastically higher. One side was not going to be returning from that battlefield alive. So what Krishna's implication for Arjuna was. Accept your limitations. That you cannot change the way other people act. You cannot change the fact that Duryodhana obstinately rejected all peace proposals. You cannot change the fact that Bhishma and Drona have decided to, because of circumstantial obligations, to support Duryodhana. You, can, you accept those limitations. But within that, you act resourcefully. So what Krishna tells Arjuna is, you are thinking, Going back, how can you shoot arrows against Bhishma and Drona? You think your arrows will hurt them. That's true, but you don't see that something else is hurting them even more. That for Bhishma and Drona, they actually were both virtuous. They loved the Pandavas and they knew the Pandavas' cause was virtuous. But somehow due to circumstances, they had to fight against Duryodhana. And although they were going to fight earnestly against Duryodhana, Duryodhana was always deriding the Pandavas. And he was deriding even Bhishma and Drona. Because he felt that they were fighting half-heartedly. Because they were soft on the Pandavas. And now for a warrior to have their integrity questioned is extremely painful. So, Krishna is saying, you don't see that Duryodhana's barbs Duryodhana's harsh words are hurting Bhishma and Drona far more. And they are spiritual beings. They are virtuous souls. When you fight in this war, you are not killing them. You are actually releasing them from a painful obligation. And because they are spiritual beings, they will be elevated to a higher destination. You think you are their well-wisher and as their well-wisher you will not fight. But Krishna says, I am the well-wisher of everyone. And I want the best, not just for you, I want the best for Bhishma and Drona also. And you are fighting and helping them on their spiritual journey onward. That is good even for them. So when we act in a mood of service to Krishna, then our vision of what we are doing changes. And that empowers us to go through whatever situations we are facing. So when you talk about spirituality as a goal transformer, what it means is we start seeing our situation in a far bigger light. It is not just this problem or that problem. We see through all these problems, God's plan is working to draw us closer to Him, to make us wiser, to make us more mature, to increase our capacity to love and to serve, to make us better beings. And we all can play a part in that plan. And then, the Gita, in one sense, externally, Arjuna's situation doesn't change. Arjuna still has the problem that he has at the beginning. But his vision has changed. So, what does spirituality do, especially? Spirituality can be many things. But if you talk about bhakti spirituality, some people go to God and they say, that, oh God, yeah. actually, I was, I was where was I was in Canada and I was after a program on college program, one boy came to me and he said that, you know, I'm currently an atheist. I said, okay. What do you mean currently? He said, in the last six months, I've changed from theism to atheism 12 times. <laughs> I said, really? Okay, why? He said, every time I pray to God, if my, if my prayer is fulfilled, I become a theist. 
<laughs> prayer is not fulfilled i become an atheist well i said that the existence of god does not depend on the fulfillment or non fulfillment of your prayer if he exists he exists if he doesn't exist he doesn't exist so what happens is some people have this vision or this conception that god should be the remover of our problems now of course sometimes god can do that but the nature of the world is that if that that, that is not going to work people have free will we have free will and we are people will make a mess of things sometimes we will make a mess of things sometimes so if we expect god to remove our problems we are setting ourselves up with an unexpected unrealistic expectation he can do that but what god does is he is the provider of a purpose that can power us through the toughest problems that can power us through all problems machitta sarva durgaani mat prasada tarishasi krishna says in 1858 if you become conscious of me you will pass over all obstacles by my grace so if we practice spirituality and raise our consciousness connect our consciousness with krishna through bhakti then we will see that the problem is problem is there and sometimes the problem will go away sometimes the problem will stay but that problem is an opportunity for us to grow and when we see that higher purpose see if we are stuck with our functional identity if i think my purpose is to be a surgeon and my hand is cut and i can't be a surgeon then people may say that think positive but if my functional identity is my essential identity if my whole life was centered on being a being a doctor surgeon and my hand is lost there is no way i can think of it positively so it's the end of my life but when we understand our functional fundamental identity then we can always find some way ahead we can say that the very fact that we are alive means god is not done with us god has something for us to do krishna has a plan and a purpose for us so we focus on that purpose krishna in this situation how can i serve you that is the conclusion of arjuna in the bhagavad gita karishye vachanam tava i will do your will and if we can also gain that determination krishna how can i serve you i want to do your will please guide me what i can do we'll find that no matter how big the difficulty that is in our life we will be able to find a way ahead we'll find a bigger goal to pursue and we'll power through those problems arjuna had put aside his bow at the start of the gita in dejection but he picked up that bow in determination at the end of the gita arjuna's bow represents our confidence our conviction our determination life's problems and adversities can make us disheartened just we just lose our will to strive to do anything but hearing the gita's wisdom understanding its spiritual message can help us all pick up our metaphorical bow ready to fight face life's challenges and fight in a mood of service to krishna i'll summarize i spoke today about two main points spirituality as a shock absorber and spirituality as a goal transformer so the shock absorber i talked about the gita starts with arjuna facing shocks his shock was that either i lose my family or i lose my profession what do i do so for a responsible person the greatest pain is not just some suffering they get but the suffering that their actions may cause and therefore krishna tells to address that question krishna says you have to withdraw your identity or take your identity down from functional identities we can have many to the fundamental identity you are a spiritual being you are an atma so when we face shocks essentially it means our functional identity or the facilities uh, associated with the functional identity are threatened or damaged or destroyed but we at our core remain undestroyed and unhurt so spirituality is not just about calming our emotions it is about challenging our conceptions of who we are so that we are, we situate our sense of identity in our fundamental identity then we can observe our situations and observe our emotions 
without being shaken or shattered by them. So that is one aspect of spirituality. We learn to tolerate difficulties. But we, don't, we, we are not affected by the situation. But another aspect of spirituality is we want to affect situations positively. So tolerance is not positivity, is not passivity. It is keeping small things small so that you can focus on the big things. So spirituality also means we act in the world with a higher purpose, a higher vision. We are talking about three teachers seeing their work differently. So the three modes, the tamas, rajas and sattva, they shape our vision of the world and they shape our vision of our role in the world. In tamas, we underestimate our capacity. In rajas, we overestimate our capacity. And most of the time, we keep oscillating between these two extremes. But in sattva, we learn to estimate our cap capacity accurately and function. And spirituality can help us better act according to our capacity because it infuses us service attitude. Service attitude means two things. We accept our limitations and we act resourcefully within our limitations. We accept our limitations not just because we can't do anything about them because, but because we see them as a part of Krishna's plan. And we act resourcefully because we see that in this situation also there is something that Krishna wants me to do. So Arjuna saw that he couldn't change who was fighting on the opposite side and the fact that they were fighting but he could fight with a higher purpose and that way he would do good for the world by neutralizing Duryodhana and he would elevate Bhishma and Drona to a higher destination. So for all of us, it, if we expect Krishna to remove problems in our life, he may or he may not. We'll set up ourselves up for disappointment. But instead, we seek from Krishna a purpose that can power us through our problems. And that purpose we can progress towards, we can intuit by praying, Krishna, how can I serve you in this situation? And that attitude, that service attitude can rejuvenate us with determination to face life's challenges, just as it rejuvenated Arjuna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? We have about 10 minutes. Yes, please. Yeah, please. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hi. All right. What I wanted to kind of understand is that Can you when fix this? Can you fix this? Okay, please continue. Sorry. Sure. Um, when, um, let's say that we are all right, when we are doing our part, Sorry, yeah. or when we are actually, um, you know, remembering the Lord and you know, praying for, uh, praying Him, He grants, you know, our wishes, or when sometimes He might relieve us of our pain. Um, but there are situations which are called act of God, you know, like a tsunami or a tornado. I mean, that's something which is beyond a man's control. Would you say that that is God's free will? Uh, he is acting that all those things that happen, would you say that's a part of his free will? Okay, that's a good question. And it's a question which will require one more class to answer. <laughs> I'll try to answer briefly. See, God is the supreme controller, but not the sole controller. Hmm? That means he has given everyone free will. And people act according to free will. So Krishna did not want the war. He even went at a peace, peace, peace messenger with a very accommodating peace proposal to Duryodhana. But Duryodhana did not listen. So God has given everyone free will. And sometimes people misuse their free will. So when anything happens, so when events happen, they can have three levels of causes. There is God's will, there is free will, and then there is evil. <laughs> so, evil, what does it mean? Evil is basically reaction to 
misuse of free will or you can say past misuse of free will so for example say like we just going along the road and suddenly a storm comes we can say okay that's god's will okay we could look at it that way but god acts in this world he doesn't act directly it is not a, krishna doesn't favor anyone he doesn't he doesn't he's neutral he's not partial towards anyone he's not averse towards anyone so god's will is the broad rubric within which everything happens but most of the things that happen in the world bhutanam yanmitha kali is because of mutual interactions of an anti of an acrimonious interactions so when suppose we commit a mistake hmm? let's take an example say suppose there's a flood coming and somebody who is supposed to warn about the flood coming that person goes to sleep on the job and then the flood spreads all over the city then is that god's will well that's that's free will being misused over there mm-hmm. but there's another point that sometimes we mis- may, some people may misuse their free will but they may not get any results that's because of the principle of karma karma basically at one level means the a correlation between action and reaction the system that connects action with reaction the law of karma we talk about but the but the subtle point is that not every reaction to an action comes immediately some reactions may be delayed so when we talk about evil what it means is we see evil happening in the world but when some evil happens to a particular person we understand that that is a result of some negative karma done in the past and it's coming delayed at present so we can't hold god responsible for that because then okay there sometimes some people uh, if if god is the supreme controller if you take it that way then why consider only the flood coming as an act of god okay the rains that nourish us every day they are also an act of god isn't it why label only the disastrous things as an act of god isn't it the benevolent things they are also acts of god then so if we are going to look at the ultimate cause then look that that ultimate cause you, can, you have to attribute everything to that ultimate cause like without rains no vegetation will grow on the earth but if on a farm weeds grow the farmer can't blame god you didn't till the land you didn't sow the seeds isn't it so if you want to look at the ultimate cause look at it for everything but if you don't want if you don't want to look at the ultimate cause you look at the immediate cause or the intermediate cause and look at that for everything so sometimes when bad things happen in our life we need to see what caused it god is not the cause of the world's problems god is the cure for the world's problems and he helps us deal with the problems he helps us face those problems the problems are caused either because we made some mistakes now or other people are making some mistakes or misdeeds now and that we are victimized by them because our own negative karma's reactions are coming to us now so that's why we understand that god is never against us god doesn't want to harm anyone but harm comes because of the way the actions lead to reactions but even in that system god is there with us to help us face those problems and to rise beyond those problems okay thank you one last question anyone yes please maraj i would like to thank you for this concept of spiritual like one is inner calmness and the other one is outer effectiveness yes so this is beautiful like i am thinking about it inner calmness once we are internally calm then then only we are going to have a better uh, wisdom and uh, we can make ourselves more productive and more effective yes so this is really beautiful and and like i am taking away this today and i would be sharing it with others so mm, this is you. the thing which i like the most thank, thank you so you. much thank you hari krishna yes spirituality has both a, a immersive aspect when we turn away from the world to cultivate inner calmness but spirituality has also inclusive aspect where we engage, turn toward the world and engage in the world to try to act in a more effective way and both those aspects both are synergistic so we do one we can do the other better and when we do other better when we outer effectively more outer externally effective then we feel more inspired 
to cultivate in our calmness and that's how we can rise higher okay thank you yes we have a question here we'll finish with that Okay, good question. So are the small things that are to be tolerated connected with the functional identity and big things connected more with the fundamental identity? Yes, in the ultimate analysis, definitely so. At the same time, in the practical level, sometimes even with the spirit of functional identity, there may be some things which are small and some things which are big. Say we are working in office and we like the job, we feel that we are contributing to the job, that job is more or less according to our nature, our, we feel it's our calling. And in that job, maybe we have a couple of colleagues who are annoying. And maybe we have a boss who is, who is a little bit uh, demanding. Now, but if we have an opportunity to do something which, is, which we feel we are growing, we are learning, we are contributing, then that is a big thing for us. And then tolerating certain human behavior at that time, that would be a small thing. So, as parents, you know, sometimes our children may be disobedient, but overall, if they are doing well in their lives, if they are, if they are doing well in their studies, they are growing up as responsible human beings, they are also developing their spirituality, then sometimes their insubordination is a small thing to be tolerated. But the big thing is that they are, they are growing up to be good human beings. So, it's even in our day-to-day -day life also, see this hierarchy understanding which is less important, which is more important, that is required in every area of life. Mm -hmm. If you are going for a job, if you are going for an important meeting in office, and suddenly somebody just cuts a car, car across us, and we feel irritated, I think, I'll teach you a lesson. And we start chasing that person, to catch that person, to give them a hearing. And then we spend an half an hour going there, and we give them a hearing, but when we go to our meeting, our boss gives us a hearing. <laughs> Isn't it? Maybe at that time, we are still tolerated. It's a small thing. Maybe a meeting in office is a big thing. So that hierarchy understanding, that's where our intelligence comes into the picture. See, our mind is very emotional, while the intelligence is rational. So the mind, because it is very emotion driven, the nature of emotion is that it can distort perception. Not always, but quite often, emotion, it distorts perceptions by making small things appear very big. That's why reason we need to balance out. Okay, yeah, this is this is not that big. Let me tolerate it. Okay. So, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki Pritai Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Prabhu. He's going to Chandra Chandra Prabhu ki Jai. So, Srila Prabhupada, this announcement, Srila Prabhupada said that st study scripture scrutinizingly and explain it from, right, understand it from multiple perspectives. He said, write your realizations. So, so as I mentioned in the introduction, I have written about 27 books. So during the pandemic, I wrote four books on the Bhagavad Gita. Unfortunately, three of those, the shipping has not yet come. But I'll quickly tell about these books and I have one over here. So there's one book on mindfulness, 365 reflections based on mindfulness. And the 365 articles with questions for reflection. Much of what I spoke today is from that book. There, we, there is three sections, nourish yourself, nourish your relationships, and nourish your devotion. So that book will probably come in a day or two, if any of you would like to order that. That's, and then there are two books which are a deeper study of the Gita. There's 365 articles, and there are these two which are about 100 articles. So relishing Bhagavad Gita is following the mood of Vishwanath Chakrithakur's commentary on the Gita. And it has just the kind of diagrams I drawn over here in the class, about 80 diagrams to explain the concepts. It focuses on how the Gita is not just philosophy, but it's actually Krishna's love for Arjuna, and ultimately divinity's love for all of humanity, expressed through the medium of philosophy. So if you want to see how the Gita can help you develop your personal faith and devotion and relationship with Krishna, then that book can be quite helpful. The other book is Bhagavad Gita Insights which is which follows the mood of Baldevidya Hushan's commentary on the Gita. He's also another prominent commentator. It approaches the Gita from a rational perspective, where uh, like the question, you know, 
is everything that happens is it god's will if god's will is supreme do we really have free will if god does everything then why should we why are we held for responsible for our actions what are the three modes how do they actually function so questions like these that may come when somebody reads the gita they are explained in the, through another set of 100 articles and this is a calendar is 365 quotes inspired by the bhagavad gita so so like based on today's theme still we fall to temptation not because we are powerless but because we are purposeless mm -hmm. so like each of these is inspired by a particular verse from gita so in the wrong doing is wrong doing is not just the wrong that we do it is also the right that we don't do mm -hmm. so this is a if you google these quotes it will take you to my website gita daily where there is an article explaining each of these quotes but even without that the quote is self explanatory it is also a very non intrusive way to introduce spirituality to friends colleagues if you give people books they may not read them but a quote everybody can read one quote per day and you can even keep this in your workplace or in your home in your reception room and then your friends relatives they come they read a quote it interests them then you can that can spark a spiritual discussion so these we have a, a few calendars available so if you want you can have these and i can sign them also if you want and the other three books also if you want they are available if you order all four books there is a 10 dollar discount also available the books will come in a few days and we'll give them to you so thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so let us loudly chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra to appreciate Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So as Prabhuji has mentioned about those books, if any of you are interested in those books, at the book table you can uh, mention your interest. And once the book comes, we can contact you by cell phone or giving you a call or text so you can receive your books. The other few announcements I want to make is, that we also have a weekly regular programs on Saturday evenings. So if, if you like this kind of talks, then please also register your interest at the voice table there. And we can send you invitations for this kind of programs. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Gita is a book which, you know, it's nice to hear one-time classes. But if you study it systematically, especially if you have guided courses going on like they're going on over here, you'll learn much more. You'll learn how to apply it. And how it will actually... Uh, become a resource for living more effectively. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare. And we also have a kids program the same time as well, where kids also learn value-based education. So if you have kids, please bring them as well. Hare Krishna. Okay. And what you could do is, maybe you could remove this.